I'm Chris Dyerwald. And here's what we'll tell you this hour. Our top headlines of the day. First, an arson attack on a swing state Trump office. How bad and how dangerous might 2016 get? Plus, rigged, drugged, and lying, Trump keeps his barrage of verbal attacks going as assault accusers pile up. Meanwhile, Wiki worries hacked emails show Team Clinton sweating the server. Did they go too far to try to cover her tracks? And should Hillary pull a no-show in Vegas? There's debate drama on the Strip with an insider from the Obama team raising the question. Finally, the most important demographic shift in politics isn't the one you think it is. The Data Dive will help you impress your friends with insider knowledge. But first, Fox News correspondents Carl Cameron and Mike Emanuel are out there trying to keep up with all the twists and turns on a very busy weekend. First, to Chappaqua, New York, where Mike Emanuel has the latest on the Democratic side. Mike. Well, Dana, Chris, good afternoon to you. With polls suggesting she is winning, Hillary Clinton's focus is on a strong performance in the third and final presidential debate. Clinton has remained out of the public eye. We've seen her motorcade, and that's about it. She's been behind closed doors working on debate preparation with Washington Super Attorney Bob Barnett helping her. The Clinton team continues dealing with the fallout from the constant drip of emails belonging to campaign chair John Podesta. One features longtime Clinton confidant Doug Band ripping on Chelsea Clinton, writing, as they say, the apple doesn't fall far. A kiss on the cheek while she is sticking a knife in the back and front. Then there's criticism of Hillary Clinton herself, coming from the Center for American Progress, is near a tandem writing about Clinton, quote, her inability to just do a national interview and communicate genuine feelings of remorse and regret is now, I fear, becoming a character problem more so than honesty. And that's coming from friends. Perhaps a reminder to all of us that today's private email can be tomorrow's public embarrassment. Dana? <laughs> Indeed. All right, thanks, Mike. Now let's check in with uh, campaign Carl Cameron. He's live at Trump Tower in New York City. Hi, Carl. Hi, Dana. Hi, Chris. Uh, Trump is doing some debate prep today, and we've really been able to see it in plain sight over the last week and a half on the campaign trail since the last debate. He has been blaming the media. He has been attacking Hillary Clinton for a lot of the WikiLeaked hacked emails that have been out there. Uh, and he's even going after fellow Republicans in the Democratic Party, saying that the system is rigged. Just a moment ago, Trump tweeted, and I quote, The Democrats have a corrupt political machine pushing crooked Hillary Clinton. We have Paul Ryan always fighting the Republican nominee. And Ryan yesterday took issue with Trump's suggestion that the election is rigged. Mike Pence this morning echoed something similar, saying that the election's results will be accepted by the American people, even though there's been an undercurrent from a lot of Trump supporters in the last couple of weeks that if, they, if Donald Trump does not win, there could be some sort of an uprising against them. Uh, Trump is effectively trying to discredit both the media and Hillary Clinton in an attempt to suppress her vote. The idea, according to a lot of Trump senior advisors, is that if they can suppress the vote, particularly for Hillary Clinton, his core loyalists can give him a win on the Electoral College map come Election Day. Dana, Chris? All right, thank you so much. Okay, um, to get a little sense of how things have been crazy town in the last 48 hours, let's take a listen to some of the highlights or lowlights from the campaign trail. I was with Donald Trump in 1980. I was sitting with him on an airplane. And he went after me on the plane. Yeah, I'm going to go after him. Believe me. She would not be my first choice, that I can tell you. The emails show that behind closed doors, speaking to these international bankers, Hillary Clinton's pledged to destroy the sovereignty of the United States. I'm standing at my podium, and she walks in front of me, right? She walks in front of me, you know? And when she walked in front of me, believe me, I wasn't impressed. How about this? After 15 minutes... We don't know each other. After 15 minutes, she said, well, that was too much. And I decided, 15 minutes? With the ladies in this place, it would be one second that it would be smack. We should take a drug test prior, because I don't know what's going on with her. But at the beginning of her last debate, she was all pumped up at the beginning. And at the end, it was like, oh, take me down. She could barely reach her car. All right, so that was just a little bit of it. I mean, you know, Mike Emanuel said, Chris, that Hillary Clinton has laid low, and she's right. letting Donald Trump fill the airways, which he has. And the other thing that's happened is um, we had something Carl Cameron talked about, which is the suggestion that elections could be rigged in America. And I actually think that that's a topic that put our podcast, before it was a TV show, temporary, um, on the map, because you talked about how Americans should have faith 
in our elections. I was thinking about that today. Well, if you th if you were to add up all the blessings that the United States has had as a as a nation, uh, there are many many things more than any other country in the world. But you would certainly put on the list of finalists for the greatest blessing that we have the fact that we have had an orderly and peaceful transfer of power, even. Uh, as civil war loomed, even as riots raged, even during war, we have had an orderly transition of power, and we've had it 44 times, and this is supposed to be the 45th time. The French are on their sixth republic. We are better at this than anybody in the world, and it is the cornerstone, in fact, of why markets, about why people, about why everybody has confidence in the United States, is because we're big, we're powerful, but we're stable. We're stable. I remember um, I was thinking earlier today about one of my favorite moments uh, when I worked at the White House was in January of 2009, just as we were um, preparing to turn over the administration to President Obama. President Bush, 43, um, invited all the living former presidents mm -hmm. and President-elect Obama to the Oval Office. And I went in with Robert Gibbs, who was going to be the press secretary for uh, uh, Obama. And I thought about that picture today because it's a remarkable amount of forgiveness that has to happen. Those campaigns mm -hmm. weren't easy, and there was a lot of angry words and allegations and accusations hurled at all of them. But I remember thinking that day that we are an example, and there's a good example between Bush huh. and Gore in 2000, that, that one, even, even despite the recount that America know. came together. And this, well, we did. I think, the, um, I think if it hadn't have been for September 11th, I think that the way that people feel, that I think that's not true because they ended up with a lot of. We, we, they, President Bush was able to get several pieces of legislation through even before September 11th. Uh, no one is taking anything away from No Child Left Behind. I think <laughs> I'm, you guys tax it, cuts it was, uh, fan, and they tax they, they cuts, sent me a check. Like it was good. Was they sent me a check? I bought a television with it. It was you great. Did? Oh, totally. and that helped the economy. To and West Virginia roared into first place <laughs> as soon as I went and bought that television. You know my point though that I, we no, do this my, over and over. I understand, but my point is there's some crackle in the wire there's some energy that is dangerous energy that is out there when people feel like the system is rigged and people feel like it doesn't work and they start to question in 2000 we were told that George Bush stole the election and Democrats including Al Gore to a certain extent worked to delegitimize yeah 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 but worked to delegitimize Bush's presidency in 04 Democrats said that they stole the election in Ohio with Diebold voting machines uh, in 2008 uh, it was the Black Panthers were blocking Republicans there are no Republicans in those districts uh, from voting in Philadelphia and all kinds of stuff so I'm not saying this is new what I'm saying is that September 11th created a pause where people said wow we should not be we need each other, and we've got to stick together and not be heinous to one another constantly. But I'm telling you that if we go back to Ross Perot, if we go back to 92, and then there's deep currents of this in the past, but basically what Trump's saying this election is it's all a fraud. And no matter what, it's a like fraud? No matter what. Like, he's down 11 points in Pennsylvania. Well, can we take a look at a couple of the polls and well, why they might be trying to bring this up now? And you even had Rudy Giuliani, one of his surrogates, suggesting that the inner cities will definitely be rigged because it's not... Um, there are not a lot of Republicans there. Okay, so here you see, um, this is the Washington Post ABC poll. What do you make of that? Uh, Only four points. Four points there. Uh, and then if you look at the Wall Street Journal poll, it's like a bajillion points. <laughs> so the aver So this is why we like polling averages. Uh, and, and there it is, the bajillion point spread. Mm -hmm. So the this would be reflective of a polling average that's like six, seven points. Um, this is uh, the normal... It's. We won't know at the end what the average or normal deficit for Trump was until we get to the end, but basically he has been between two and ten points. Is this the normal range for his deficit, six or seven points? Maybe. But at this point in 2000, in 1996, Bob Dole was in a similar situation, right? And he had already mm -hmm. said, where is the outrage? And then people said, not here, bro. <laughs> um, but... In, he knew that, and the Republicans and he worked together to try to save the Senate. They actually gained two Senate seats in 1996. What we're witnessing this time is somebody that is in the same position as Dole was, who is asking where's the outrage, but doesn't seem to want, there doesn't seem to be any move towards normalizing things and being cool. I'm only smiling because I'm remembering um, in 1998, okay. 1990, I moved to England. 
and it was the summertime, even though it was kind of cold all the time. And I remember I took I took too many clothes, too many too too many things, and I moved to England. I got married to Peter, and I had a Dole Kemp T-shirt. And I wore that everywhere I went. She's so cool. <laughs> She's just the coolest. Total the, just nerd. The coolest. I still have that T-shirt somewhere. People in Britain just I was you there were cool. in 1996. All right, <laughs> uh, we've got to take a quick break. Back with our panel to talk about the latest WikiLeaks dump and Hillary Clinton, and of course, all of this is leading towards the big event, the Ooh. final presidential debate. It will be moderated by our very own Chris Wallace, and you can watch it right here on Fox News Channel Wednesday night. And you and I will be on afterwards. It's going to be awesome. There was a story uh, broken by Steve Hayes with the Weekly Standard last night uh, and in which uh, an interview with FBI investigators looking at Secretary Clinton's uh, email practices, uh, an FBI records and classification official said that he felt pressure from Patrick Kennedy, a senior State Department official, to change the classification of some Hillary Clinton emails. To your knowledge, did anyone associated with Secretary Clinton or her campaign ask or instruct Kennedy to seek changes to classification of emails? Absolutely not. I have no knowledge that that happened. Absolutely not. All right. Tim Kaine getting grilled a bit this morning by Brett Baer on Fox News Sunday about some new WikiLeaks revelations. Let's bring in this week's panel of guests to talk about it and much more. First, David Drucker, senior correspondent for the Washington Examiner and host of a great podcast called Examining Politics like seven, on Podcast right. One. I love it. <laughs> then you have Daniel Halper, Washington Bureau Chief at the New York Post and New York Times bestselling author. Great to have him. And Harry Enton, senior political writer for 538.com and our first return guest. Wow. So welcome. Wow. Nice to have you. Did it. Um, so wow. there hadn't really been any bombshells in the WikiLeaks hack. But there was some uncomfortable conversation that the Clinton right. campaign were having, and now this is something pretty serious, as Brett was just describing. So basically, it's like this: uh, everything that we had seen in the WikiLeaks was could be described as sort of broadly gross, uh, confirming the kinds of things that Daniel wrote about in his book, where it's sort of it's grubby, it's it's the kind of stuff that people talk about in politics, like "Ooh, do we have to suck up to this guy?" or "I hate that guy," "I hope he loses," and it was all embarrassing, but there wasn't anything in there. Now there's a thread of something, which is how far did they go? essentially in urging the uh, Department of Justice and the FBI and also some intimations that maybe there was some uh, malice of forethought in the elimination of some emails. And the so, FBI has said no that did actually and the FBI, everything is fine. The FBI said it didn't but I want to start with you David. When we talk about the WikiLeaks there's been first of all we don't know if it's true because nobody confirms anything and this is the work of some shady Grady's out there. But uh, if, if these things are true, are we seeing the transition from the WikiLeaks to embarrassing to dangerous? Well, not necessarily, but only time will tell. I mean, I think part of the issue with the WikiLeaks is that there is so much information out there that yeah. is coming out every day. The barrage. That it all kind of, it, they drown each other out. Also, there is so much in there that is harmless and stupid and doesn't matter. Right. That everybody makes, that, that, that Clinton's opponents are all treating equally. I, I mean, basically, it, well, Hillary Clinton and her team are strategizing on how to win the election. Ah, bombshell, caught. Right. They uh, tried to win. Right. Oh, wait, there's a thing from the FBI. Oh, bombshell, caught. Right. And, and so for a, a regular voter to put, put two and two together at the same time that a flood of negative information is coming out about Trump at a time in which Trump is dominating the headlines but not in a good way for right. him, I think makes it difficult for this to chime in now to, to make a difference, I should say. Now, that could change. If information comes to light that basically says Clinton herself did this, yeah, that's different. But even in this thread, it's not Clinton did this. It's these other people did things f maybe for her. But even Steve Hayes wrote in that story, which was a great story, which I read, that no evidence came out of that that implicated her directly. And the reason that matters is because the only way you really get to her is by implicating her directly by her actions. Is he right? I think so. Look, there's like a timer going off. You know, the cake is basically baked in right. the sense that th this election is pretty much set. We're three now, weeks away. There's right. a couple theories of that race and how it will play out. There's the Hillary Clinton theory, which is basically we've won and we're up in every single poll, including all the states that we need to win. We're probably going to win. It's pretty convincing. There's a lot of data to back that up. There's the Donald Trump theory of the race, which is that, well, we don't know. They're, the we're, we're behind are wrong. the polls. Or the they're polls rigged. Are wrong. They're either they're wrong rigged. or they're rigged. And 
and our this supporters silent majority. Are, so, are so strong and they're going to show up and they're enthusiastic. Exactly. And we've got the enthusiasm and we're going to win. And we'll see, right, which theory is correct. Obviously, you probably want the data on your side. And But I think the point is, is that even... Each of these new revelations, even for Donald Trump, when each of these new women come forward as they have this past week, I think with the first one, you get a lot of play, the second one, but at some point, it becomes part of returns, the thing, right? And it becomes kind of baked in a little bit, and I think it's probably pretty much set, and there isn't that much that can actually can, change the outcome. Can I ask Carrie a question? Yeah. Cool. Okay, so I wonder, the idea of the the lake so dirty that you that no one wants to swim in it and that's sort of what obama successfully did to romney in two thousand and twelve it was like we're gonna go dirty or we're gonna go ugly early we're gonna you're gonna call you a vampire we're gonna and we're not gonna we're not going to worry about winning we're gonna worry about a base creating a base versus base election and the president was pretty confident and he was quite right that he could get his base to the polls better than romney could sure. the trump argument seems to be that with the use of the wikileaks make everything as gross as possible and say he, I, I, I said these things, and women say these things about me, but Bill Clinton is gross, and you're gross too, and the WikiLeaks, and gross, gross, gross. If you dial down voter turnout to the ground, mm -hmm. who does that help? Well, it helps Donald Trump if voter turnout is specifically very, very low. That's why Republicans do very well in midterm elections. Republican voters are far more reliable. But we just don't see any proof of that in the early voting numbers, whether they be from Virginia or North Carolina. And more than that, when you look at the favorability ratings for both Trump and Clinton, you see no proof that he's been able to muddy the water so much, even though Clinton's dislike, Donald Trump is far more disliked. And that makes a difference, and that's why she's ahead in the polls right now. Do you want to give just a quick comment, Harry, about the idea that the elections are rigged? Because I saw you tweet about it yesterday, and I thought it was worth bringing up again. Uh, I, I would just say it's absolute garbage. There's no proof that these elections are rigged. The chief elections officers in a majority of states that have a majority of electoral votes are controlled by Republicans. It's just very, very difficult to rig an election because each state holds its own election. Each county has its own county, you know, election county uh, board. It's just impossible. There's no proof of it at all. But there's a thing, and, and this is, it's the playing with fire approach. So you can say that it's rigged in an in a abstract sense to say that most reporters are liberal. There's liberal media bias. You can say that it's rigged sure. in the sense that uh, the Democrats uh, are advantaged on electoral math. That you can say that the conditions are rigged in, in some sense. But in, in errantly, in, inevitably, that's going to bleed over into it is actually rigged and the vote is fixed and you can't trust this outcome. Well, that's why words matter so much. But look, I think that for years we have talked about media bias against Republicans, which exists. For years we have talked about, well, California is a blue state. What? California. <laughs> I know. Big I get blue. it. I know it's a big surprise. Big it's blue. Gonna, it's, people are going to hurt. You heard it here first. I'll tell you what. 50, California will go blue. 55 <laughs> electoral votes are guaranteed to the Democratic Party because people in California are liberals. We're going to alert Bill gonna Hammer so that he can get a jump start but on that. But this now. is the first time we've had a major uh, party nominee talk about the idea that there are global forces and Bankers. subterfuges that are stealing run. the election. All right, All right, we'll be right back. Coming up, the real nail-biter on election night could be what happens to control of the Senate. Ooh. If we lose the Senate, do you know who becomes the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee? A guy named Bernie Sanders. You ever heard of him? <laughs> When finally the guy that they nominated and they endorsed and they supported is caught on tape saying things that no decent person would even think, much less say, much less brag about, much less laugh about, or joke about, much less act on, you can't wait until that finally happens and then say, oh, that's too much, that's enough, and think that somehow you are showing any kind of leadership and deserve to be elected to the United States Senate. If we lose the Senate, do you know who becomes the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee? A guy named Bernie Sanders. You ever heard of him? <laughs> All right, that was President Obama and House Speaker Paul Ryan, but for how long now? Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, I know, you just dun, said... Dun, dun, you dun, dun. Like, dumped on the segment before we even got started. No, the, the question is, what is happening to the down ballot races? And we do have, I want to show you three polls real quickly and then talk to our panel and you about it. Um, in New Hampshire, uh, we have new polls here showing that Kelly Ayotte is still in the lead. She, and, and she has, by the way, uh, done better than 
any other candidate except for maybe Rob Portman in Ohio at creating distance and separation in the numbers with Donald Trump. He goes down, he goes down further, he comes back a little bit. She has stayed with a steady lead there, and I think it's a testament to her, her just basic skill set for that state. All right, what about Nevada here? We have uh, new polls there. This is an important seat. Joe Heck now behind. Now this, yeah, and this is significant because this was a race of Democrat. This is Harry Reid's seat. He had handpicked. He didn't want to lose that one. He had handpicked uh, Catherine Cortez Masto, former Attorney General of the State, and she was going to be great. And then Heck, for two things happened. Heck Trump, of a good candidate. Oh. <laughs> Oh, it Come hurts on. on the inside. Um, <laughs> She's the, here all week. Wow. Uh, the, he, he, he had picked her. She was supposed to be good. Then Joe Heck, who's in Congress, did very well. And Trump outperformed in that state. It has a lot of demographic profile that fits with Trump's voter, and he had done well. Well, now he and Heck are both drifting downward. And the other one, of course, we just have news out of North Carolina about the um, GOP office, the Trump office, being firebombed today, and that you'll see more on that uh, in the upcoming show. Um, but look here, uh, Richard Burr still a little bit ahead and North Carolina is an important state. I continue to I, I continue to not think this is a race. She's not a very good candidate. I mean he's not a great candidate either, but I mean in the, <gasps> what? I like it. Well you may like it. I'm just saying when it comes to I I have no idea what people do when they get in office, but I can tell you that when it As comes to running for office, he's a kind of a mm. Well let's take it around. Harry, what do you think in terms of the Republicans ability to maintain a majority in the Senate? Well one of the most difficult Difficult, but one of the most interesting things that we've seen over the past few weeks is that even as Hillary Clinton's lead has been expanding, Democrats in these Senate races have not been expanding their leads. It seems to me what's going on is that voters understand that Hillary Clinton's ahead, but they also understand that they don't really like her, they just really dislike Donald Trump. So they're going to say, okay, we're going to check and balance her. And that's why Republicans are at least remaining competitive, even if they have an uphill decline. Daniel, you wrote a book called Clinton, Inc. Are you not surprised that Clinton is a drag on some of these Democratic candidates? No, we always knew she was going to be a bad candidate. We just thought that the Republican candidate would be slightly more popular. So we're sort of surprised that, that these two very unpopular candidates, and of course they have their fans, but they are facing off against each other. Um, I, I, Harry's right that the polls show that there is this philosophical understanding by a lot of voters who think, hey, well, if we're going to have one of these people, we might as well have the opposite checking them and keeping, you know, if so Hillary splitting. wins, ticket splitting. It just practically, that's always less likely to happen than people understand or would like it to be. People do want that, I think, and for the most part, certainly moderates, but it just doesn't happen as much. And I'm sort of, I sort of think the Senate will be very hard, even if, even if Republicans were going to run away with this election, the Senate would be very hard to keep defending states oh, like Illinois, fiddle -dee. Wisconsin. Fiddle dee, dag on. I know. I think hard. Daniel's if right. Election, I'm not. If they held the election today, Drucker, back me up. If they held the election today, <laughs> or I'll Dunder, cut your mic. I'll, I'll, I'll just cut it. We don't do that. Uh, we, that <laughs> Who do you yeah, think? Who do you think I am? Exactly. What kind of deal do you think this is? Uh, if they held the election today, the Democrats would gain two seats. And right. they need four to take the majority. Right, they need four, four, four in the if, presidency. Four if Clinton wins, correct, and, f and five if she doesn't. Look, I think that given that Clinton is a, um, a bad candidate and has a lot of flaws and is underwater, just not as much as Trump, we're taking for granted actually how well Republicans running for Senate are doing. And what that shows you is campaigns and good candidates matter. The fact that Toomey has a chance to win, a yacht has a chance to win, uh, Burr is in the game despite Easy. Clinton, right, but he still has to overcompensate. Yes, to go the outside fact of that his Heck house. could still win even though Clinton has pulled ahead. Um, that means that what you see is this is what happens when Republicans nominate good candidates that run very good campaigns. And we haven't talked about Marco Rubio or Rob Portman because you don't have to. But the point is why they did the work and they're good candidates. And this is what Republicans could have done at the presidential level this cycle if their voters hadn't wanted an outsider so bad that they were willing to look past all of his flaws. Have you seen Rob Portman's latest fire on it? Is stronger together. He is literally <laughs> borrowing. No. Yes, I just and, saw it. He's literally and borrowing Harry. Hillary Clinton's slogan. That's because amazing. Because he needs voters that want Clinton. But to it also, also shows him. that it's like it takes a little bit of fantastical thinking to think that that's going to work. It could so backfire. It's working for Harry. It's Harry. working so far. He's got a double. Wait, 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 wait. But it's tight, and his Harry and his we need are you to we need you to bring information and data to this otherwise fact-free <laughs> discussion. <laughs>
<laughs> and that is this. Does data matter? We have, in yes. recent history, we've become a, a, accustomed to about a one-to-one -one correlation when we talk about Senate votes and presidential vote. Party identification is the... Is the it's a it's great the, drug. It's the crusher, uh, especially because it changes. Um, but the... We could be witnessing a decoupling, couldn't we? Sure, we could. And I should point out that the correlation in Senate races is less than it is in House races. Uh -huh. And that's why one of the reasons we'll get to this is why we expect the Republicans are going to hold on to the House. But in the Senate, it wouldn't be shocking to me if Republicans maintain control for the reasons we just said. Burn, Dana. Right. right Burn. I, I also had to eat crow after last week because Republicans flip flop flipped on score. Trump. And so I'm not keeping score I'll be eating things. that in the commercial break. All right, we've got much more as I'll tell you what continues. But while we take this short break, here's what you need to do. Go to foxnews.com slash PS podcast to listen and subscribe, of course. And you can also sign up for the Fox News halftime report. I write it. You'll love it. I steal their work and put it in it. And it's free. <laughs> so it's worth every penny. All right, it's time for the I'll Tell You What data dive on what might be the most important demographic trend in politics. I want people tomorrow when they go to work yeah. to impress their friends. By, talking about, by talking about demography? And women. <laughs> well, there is that. Okay. okay, fair. All right, fair. You got me there. All right, okay, first, tell us what. As, as always, let's start with last week's halftime report average of actual polls without garbage polls in them. And it was 45.6 to 40.4. Hillary Clinton up by a chunk. So what happened this week? Let's take a look. And Kablooey, uh, you see there, uh, moves up to an eight-point uh, advantage for Hillary Clinton. So not so dope. Uh, okay, here we see what matters. And what we're talking about this week are, here is the a median age at first marriage, 1890 to present. This is from the Census Bureau. Why am I showing you that? So here's the deal. Essentially, married women... Dudes are Republicans. Uh, married women are Republicans. Single women are Democrats. And by a lot, like by quite a lot. And as you can see over time here, uh, we've had later and later age for marriage now approaching 30. Uh, okay, so here is how that has affected the electorate. And you see a straight line going up in terms of the share of the electorate that are single women, which tend to be more Democratic. And you see we're up now 20... I and, yes. I, and I should clarify something earlier. It's 31% um, of the electorate is single women, but it, that does not just mean younger women. That could be single for any reason, never single married, separated, divorced, or divorced, even widowed. Or even widowed. This is true. Widows included in these numbers. Okay. Uh, so let's see how single women have been voting. Overwhelmingly Democratic, like Grande. Uh, you see George W. Bush was able to uh, get to 40% in 2004, but basically this is a massively uh, Democratic constituency. So we see numbers like this we see 67 percent we see 70 percent so how is it going now let's look at the latest fox news poll on how single women uh, are voting nope go back the one the fox news poll our most recent fox news poll uh basically said that it oh well we don't have that one but if we did i'm gonna make it with sock puppets and it basically says it's three to one okay it's three to one clinton for trump. versus trump and they're a larger share of the electorate uh, so this is essentially the problem. He is underperforming even those bad numbers with these single women, and they're a growing portion of it. And I just want to close with this. So these are the swing states with the highest percentage of unmarried women. Uh, and that's... Oh, no, there it is. There's the poll. Bring it back. I loved it so much. Now I really want to see it. Look at it. Okay, it's so good. Go. There it is. So it's 60 to 45. Okay. Or no, it's 60 to 19. Whoops, 60 to 19 unmarried. That's not good. And it's 45 to 40 among married women. So this makes it clear. And the longer they wait to get married. Uh, so here are the swing states with the highest percentage of unmarried females. This is where uh, the guys ought to go. Uh, Florida, <laughs> Georgia, Nevada, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. These are the states with the lowest percentage, swing states with the lowest percentage of uh, unmarried females. Uh, these are f uh, Iowa through Colorado. Ladies, that might be good odds for you there. The, but the odd, odd, odds are good, but the goods may be odd. <laughs> um, and that is the data dive. Uh, so I'm wondering... Looking at the, that was a lot of data, and so now we have Harry. I'm going to ask you this: How durable might that be for Democrats if they have if they do well this time around? How do you think that this could turn around in the future? I, I, I am very reluctant to base future trends off of one election. 
Right. But what we do see this election, I think it's very important to point out, is we are looking at the largest gender gap, the difference between how men are voting and how women are voting since at least 1952. You want to show them that we can show we can actually show that number. Yeah. We have that. We do have that. We have. Uh, we have. The, we can. We can take a look at men versus women voters in the in the latest polls today. We'll get that while you're talking. Go yeah, ahead. and and it's just a huge thing. And what's very interesting to me is men are voting about the way you'd expect in a close election, right? We normally expect a gender gap, but women are voting far more democratic than we would normally expect. And that to me says that something's going on. Hint, hint. Mr. Donald Trump making all of these statements, right. and women are reacting to it. And if Donald Trump weren't the nominee, then this race would probably be significantly closer. Was it like this at the beginning of the race, David? Because because women, he did okay with women sort of going at the beginning. At the beginning, it was okay, and then in June, and then in July, actually, he did okay. Look, I think if you if you want to start from May fourth, and David, I don't want to interrupt, but here's the poll, here's the gender gap, and what you can see is that Hillary Clinton is killing it with women. Donald Trump isn't doing well enough with men. He's underperforming where Mitt Romney was. Yeah, look, I, I I think there's. There's something that we can understand about how the general election has unfolded is that while it's true that Trump came to the general election with more flaws than most recent candidates, um, what he did was give credence to all the negative ads that Hillary Clinton uh, and her allies put on the air about him. Yeah. So that usually what happens is you get out of the primary and you have some problems and then you're like, you, you pivot, you know, that famous, the, the <laughs> We've, how many times have we use that word? It's silly at this point. I've done a pirouette since then. Yes, <laughs> but instead of pivoting, he did the op He actually went back the other direction, and so in instead of just having all of the tape that we had about Trump in the in the primary, that anybody that understands general elections knew was not going to play well for him, he said, "Let me just make sure you know it's all true. <laughs> I'll attack a judge for being a Mexican. I'll attack a Gold Star family." And on and, down, and then Alicia Machado, and, and so on down the line. Let me ask you something, Daniel. Um, Hillary Clinton didn't necessarily start out this campaign saying, "Vote for me because I'll be the first woman," and yet gender has become one of the biggest issues in the campaign. She's never really hit, had to hit people over the head with it. It's sort of oh hey, my gosh, hey, that convention. Know, she has all that was. They had a glass and ceiling un animation. <laughs> no, no, no. They have tried to hit people over the head, but she hasn't sort of at various points, let me say. But there Soft sell. are other things that, as David alluded to, that Donald Trump has done to have allowed Hillary to sort of back off. Okay. It's that tape release that he says that he's a star and he can do these things to women, that doesn't help you with women. Hillary doesn't need to say, I'm going to be the first woman president, you need to elect me to make history. When you have that tape playing nonstop on all the news outlets and, and on was, all it newspapers. Was raw. It's That's very true. raw. We're, and you don't we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna come right back though because we love this panel. We're going to take a quick break but when we come back the original and never been improved upon patented I'll tell you what news quiz and as we go back to break I want to show you this little bit of Chris's new favorite song. Closely, our panelists have been paying attention to current <laughs> events this week. I love this part. Na, na, na. Uh, yes, it is the I'll Tell You What news quiz. And our first question goes to David Drucker, 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 Drucker. Uh, Fox News colleague Chris Wallace will moderate Wednesday's third and final presidential debate in Las Vegas, Nevada. It is fitting because Nevada is a key swing state which has divided its votes evenly between Republicans and Democrats four for four in the past eight elections. But which candidate was the first to win the state's electoral votes? Was it A? William Jennings Bryant, B, Dwight David Eisenhower, C, Abraham Lincoln, or D, Woodrow Wilson. You can look at the monitor there if you need to. Oh, we can we pull it back up? I, I can look at the side of my head. Um, William Jennings Bryant, William Eisenhower, Jennings. Woodrow, Lincoln, gonna, or Wilson? Or I'm going to go with Wilson. The correct answer is Abraham Lincoln because they rushed Nevada into the Union because they hit the Comstock ah. load and they needed to pay for the war. Very interesting. All right, question two goes to Daniel. The buzz this week was about Bob Dylan's Nobel Prize in Literature, but the Royal Swedish Academy also gave out its award for economics to two researchers, one from Harvard and one from MIT. What was their breakthrough? A, new ways to measure who benefits most in contracts. B, explaining how animals use forms of currency. C, a new formula to assess <laughs> capital depreciation. Or D, 
filling out Kim Kardashian's insurance claim for her stolen jewelry. It's D. Say it's D. <laughs> I gotta go D then, right? <laughs> Nobel Prize. Uh, Nobel man, I... Uh... You skipped that article? I skipped totally. It's totally skipped like I'm reading about I the election. Too. I didn't Who know this one. Uh, it is I'll go, A. Uh, oh, I was going to help you. Don't worry, I was going to guess C. <laughs> you were going to guess C. I'm yeah. sorry. I, I like to help the guests. I was between A and C. And, because and was they're that, most boring. New ways to measure who benefits like most in yeah. contracts. <laughs> All right, and our final news quiz question goes to Harry. Oh, God. A new hot button issue has threatened to shake up a New York assembly race on Long Island. Challenger Dean Hart has leveled what charge against incumbent Michael Montesanto? A, running an unlicensed petting zoo. B, being a phony Billy Joel fan. C, for mispronouncing coffee. Or D, being a horrible driver. I, I'm, tough. I mean, Billy Joel is huge out on Long Island, so I'm going to say Billy Joel. Can you uh -huh. believe this one's an audio daily double? Take it away. <laughs> there he is. Billy Joel, he did it. He's a big deal on uh, Long Island. And in fact, the complaint was the complaint was that he had not succeeded in delivering, renaming a section of road for ah. Billy Joel. And it's further evidence that, it, you know, he, he just can't do his job. He, he's he done now. Feel it. Uh, we, we have only one minute, but I wanted to show you this poll. Um, we have Utah presidential poll in Monmouth. Uh, out of Monmouth, the uh, the poll. Do we have that here? We yes, can pull it up. about the third this party. This is race. about um, Evan McMullen. You're going to see a little bit more about him on 8 o'clock show with Brett Baird yes, tonight. Yes, you did, and he, was, and he was on earlier. But here we have uh, Eglish McMuffin. Uh, no, Evan, Evan McMullen in Utah uh, doing quite well. And there's another poll that was taken earlier for the Deseret News out there that shows him even closer, and Clinton and Trump in a tie. Uh, Drugger, do you think it's possible? I think it's... I think it's possible, and watch uh, Idaho. You might be able to move some numbers there. Right. You, Harry? Uh, absolutely possible. He'd be the first third party or independent candidate to win a state since 1968. And then, What's your call? I think he's going to do it. He's, his ID is very low, like 50, 60 percent. I think a couple more weeks, a couple more, couple more TV and hits. Imagine if Boost he was on that. I'll tell you what podcast TV show. Imagine that. <laughs> be you. All right. As we head into this break, if you've heard our podcast, you know that we ask our viewers where you find America. This week, Elliot Tyler sent us this picture. He said, America is my dad's garden in a tiny holler in western North Carolina. You pronounced you? that right. Of course I did. All right, stay with us because next I will try to stuff the star well with two presidential history trivia questions. How do you think Chris will do this week? We'll find out. Welcome back to Perino and Star Well. I'll tell you what, it's time for my favorite part of the show, Stump the Star Well. Question Lordy one. Day. He was the last vice president to have not served in Congress. Uh, nope, no, 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 nope. Last nope. vice president not, not to serve, to serve in, Congress. in Congress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, boy, you got to keep going pretty far back. Um, Initials in R. Nelson Rockefeller never served in Con Of course Nelson Rockefeller Ah, never there we go. There we go. Never, never served in All right, question number two. Are you ready? Yeah. Only three vice presidents.